good evening everybody um thank you for attending this uh, talk by hyderabad urban labs on urban floods i'd like to just give a very brief introduction about what a uh, center for development policy and practice is we are a research organization and we conduct um research on various development concerns and public policy issues um we have been established in the year 2021 with a young organization of three years if you look back there those are all the publications we have done so far we do working papers on uh, issues on education health um, we have publications book publications we have a series uh, which is going on uh, regarding muslims in various states we started off with uh, telangana um, now we have uttar pradesh and rajasthan going on um, we also have done uh, we also have a cultural uh, aspect of this organization which is the bazm we conduct a uh, bazm online events on tuesday uh, uh, it's an online event where uh, people from across the world join the session and they share their own poetry or um, favorite poems of their own or uh, urdu poetry that they um, would like to share with others and um, um, on the first wednesday of every month we have an offline event in lamkan which is in manjara hills and this initiative is to promote uh, urdu poetry and urdu culture because it is something that is on the decline and it's just so that uh, people are aware of the culture as such and um, yes so this is something that we do we also have a journal which is the journal of development policy it's a <laughs> Uh, by annual uh, publication we release that so uh, these are all uh, some of the publications and uh, issues that we work on i'd like to hand over the mic to sir uh, and he will start the event for the day thank you so much thank you apurva and thank you all for being here can you all hear me oh i don't need this no thanks um thank you all for being here um can you all hear me at the back yes. and you can all see me also no. I, i would want all of you to hear a little bit from uh, uh, mr mahendra um but he will speak after i do the uh, initial presentation um and please don't think of this as me revealing something great which i'm not um uh, definitely not going to do a lot of the things that we are going to say are things that are already known to people what we have actually done in this process is to collate things that we um have picked up from people and there is a reason why we did that and not pretended at all to uh, be able to say something very new uh, and i'm going to explain that uh, in a moment as we walk through the presentation so this is actually a presentation about a study that we are about to conclude which is on uh, very broadly titled reducing um, disaster risk reduction in the city of hyderabad but uh, uh it is focused on urban floods uh it's a twin of another study that we have also just concluded which uh, arpita my colleague who is in the back of the room uh, had worked on which is to look at the flood in the godavari river uh as you some of you would know uh 2022 was the year in which we had a really bad flood in the godavari which is uh, as bad as it was in 1986 it was after a long time that things were really bad uh but hyderabad has been seeing floods in a very bad situation for a long time um so what we are trying to do is because this is supported by unicef part of the uh, goal is to try and understand how um the risk is experienced by young people and children um but young people and children are uh, a way of entering the problem uh the risk is actually uh, borne by a lot of people in many many different ways and part of what we are trying to argue in this is that uh, maybe urban floods are not merely engineering issues that can be understood modeled and resolved through engineering solutions and and the reason why we thought that it is really important to say this is because a lot of the work that has been happening and believe me there's a huge amount of resources being spent on understanding urban floods it is all being spent on number one doing very very detailed modelings of the flood and the goal being that at some point of time we should be able to give really really early warnings uh and for me the interest in the urban floods in hyderabad particularly began actually on a very funny moment uh i was uh, coming back from somewhere in 2017 was actually in, in an airport 
and one journalist called me up and said that, sir, we just heard that uh, the government has decided to build an app for early flood warning for floods in Hyderabad city. And I laughed. I just couldn't tell. It was just an instinctive response. And I said, um, you know, you get water up to ankles and you're going to tell them that in the next 10 minutes you're going to get it up to your knees, right? Is that how it's going to work? And the journalist then went and wrote about it. That ki bol diya hai, So then somebody in the government contacted me and said, agar aap aisa bol de rahe, to kuch, kuch aur rasta dikhao hamko. Yeah. Right? So I said, okay. So we had some series of conversations and I realized at that time that there are a number of ways in which government institutions have gotten used to thinking about these problems and they can't get away from that so easily. And part of that is this belief that we can predict and announce early enough and that's going to solve part of the problem. Two, that we can actually find an infrastructural solution by investing money in building new infrastructure or repairing old infrastructure. Right? So over the years, between 2017 and um, between 2017 and 2022, uh, what uh, happened is that year after year we saw a lot of floods. Uh, year after year we heard the same stories being told by a number of people, which is that this is the maximum amount of precipitation that we have seen on a Thursday in the last 100 years. Right? It's, it's that, that, that kind of a ridiculous situation where you're saying that something unusual has happened and therefore we have messed up, right? And what we kept thinking is that ki, this is not such an unusual thing. Hyderabad has always known really, really unusual amounts of rain happening every now and then, right? And so we thought that it is really important to make this case that blaming it on extreme weather events, blaming it on old infrastructure, um, blaming it on um, um, bad planning are not going to get us very far. Blaming it on encroachments is the worst thing because that is the laziest response in the sense that we keep saying that ki encroachment hua hai. Ultimately, if you look at it, most of the people who are supposed to have encroached actually have legal papers of some kind or the other because that is how the urban property markets work. Kahin na kahin se wo kagaz bana hi lete hai, right? Encroachment is when it is something patently illegal. And most of these are at some point of time illegal, but they've been regularized. And that's an issue that we can't actually get around. Therefore, what happens is that people keep saying that we have identified all the irregular structures, but that inventory will never be made public and nobody really acts on it. Nothing is ever really pulled down, right? It's impossible to pull down buildings in the city. So what do we do, right? So what we then therefore started doing in, in, in uh, our work is to go on constantly coming up with new ways of thinking about floods. One of the ideas that, that one of my colleagues suggested uh, uh, two years ago was that we need to b begin to think about what is the absorptive capacity of the city. The pani padta hai, to kaha jata hai ye pani, right? And that's an issue that actually needs to be modeled. One of the things that has been very little understood in our cities is that our cities are all very deeply dependent on shallow aquifers, right? So when it rains, the water just goes into your shallow aquifer. But what has happened is that most of our built environment now has a cellar space. And that cellar space is literally going and occupying the shallow aquifer, right? Where the water can be held is where we have built our parking space, right? Where the water will flow, that's where we have built our roads. So therefore, we have a very difficult situation where we can't actually predict, where we cannot even model. The second thing that happens is that even when you can build a model for now, by the time you built the model, by the time you put everything together, the situation has already changed because what normally happens is that instinctively, the moment you see something getting flooded this year, you're going to come up with a solution within the micro environment, right? You raise the, some land here, you build something there, you do something. So it shifts. So if you're working with satellite imagery, then you really have no way of knowing anything because things are happening on a much, much, much more micro scale. You can do a drone uh, surveys, but by the time you've come back with, with all the imageries, things have already changed. So what should we be doing? Our solution, or at least some kind of a conceptual framing for that 
which is where this whole thing began is that we really need to think about the floods in the city as something which is going to happen it will hit us we don't know where it is going to hit us the next time but what we will know is how have people suffered who suffered in what ways and how have we helped people recover from that flood right so basically what we are saying is that resilience in the city is about staking it that ki flood will happen but i know how to live with that flood right and i'm saying this because uh, uh, this is how many many areas which have historically been flood prone dealt with it people live with floods and flood is not something terrible it happens you live with it you kind of come up with ways of finding how to live with it and true enough in our study we found something very interesting the people who actually saved lives in hyderabad in the 2020 flood are people from bihar even before any of our rescue teams could reach the place it was the bihari workers in hyderabad city who looked at the waters and said we know how this works we know how to build rafts we know how to build build, build boats we will build them and we will get people out just let us do it and they were the ones who actually saved the people in the first round the first responders were actually those guys right and Azharbhai will know a lot more of those details because he was the one who was dealing with them. But this is what it was, right? So people have figured out how to do it, and we need to understand what these processes are. So with that in mind, I'm just going to quickly run through a presentation about what we studied, what we understood, and what we think could be the focal points. And that I want to open up for further discussion because I think that this is not necessarily a situation where a couple of experts can tell what needs to be done. we need to really really learn to live with some kind of a hive mind some kind of collective intelligence where people can make suggestions on what needs to be done and what we need to do is to put together a program wherein all of these collective uh, capacities can be brought to bear on the problem right and in that sense i'm really really glad and happy that many of the people who are here in this room are people who have actually been in the floods I, when i 2020 floods i actually went with with azhar bhai he was the one who took me and i was just telling him that on 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 uh, uh, the second day of the rains he called me and said samajh mein nahi aa raha pani kahan se aa raha hai right we can see the rain has stopped the water should not be rising but it is rising and we don't understand right that was when we started actually casting about to see who could do the quick gis uh, uh, analysis to figure out where is the water coming from right and they took us a few hours to figure out where the water is coming from and we did it from satellite imagery right so i'm not at all someone who says that that new technologies are, are useless but what we also realized is that that was not enough for us to respond to it right what we needed to do in that place was something very very complicated and different um in fact some of those places are still under water the water just has not gone and no amount of satellite imagery can help us solve a problem like that which is deeply politicized which is deeply uh, caught up in all kinds of local social problems yeah so with that broad preface i'm just going to quickly run through a set of slides so that we can talk about where we can go with this so these are all the different organizations there were many many more um some of you would remember uh, on uh, road number 12 there used to be an old audi car showroom and that was the place where a lot of activity happened for for many many months and that was actually started with the response to covid and then suddenly it turned into the flood and that i think is a very important thing to remember that covid lockdown that turned into the flood and from flood it again went back into covid right so there were so many different things which i'll come to as a recurring theme again that the urban risk is always a cascading risk it's not an isolated risk it is a risk that rides upon rides upon rides upon one after the other different kinds of risks and so it's really important for us to understand conceptually कि कोविड और फ्लड एक के पीछे एक एक साथ जब आते हैं तो व्हाट शुड वी बी डूइंग व्हाट काइंड ऑफ कैपेसिटीज इन 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 माय अंडरस्टैंडिंग व्हाट एक्चुअली हैपेंड वाज दैट आजम भाई फिगर्ड आउट हाउ टू मूव थिंग्स इन द सिटी ड्यूरिंग कोविड 
Uh, Azharbai was figuring out how to reach money to people during the lockdown. And both of them had networks and connections in the city with people, relationships of trust. All of those things got mobilized at one go and came together to make the flood relief work happen in a particular way. Right? And I'm just using Azam Bhai and Azhar Bhai as examples, but there were many other people who were doing exactly this. Right? It was the coming together of people who had those relationships of trust and local knowledge, which may or may not be possible for us to reproduce again. And that is the key thing. How do we reproduce these kinds of, 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 of things that happen at one time? How can we stabilize them? How can we create standard operating procedures out of these? so that we can respond to the flood again next time when it happens. So urban floods are highly localized events which point to extreme precipitation. Like I said, ki bahut zyada barish bahut kam time mein ho jata hai. It has been happening increasingly more frequently in many places. But Hyderabad, we have known this even in the 19th century. You know, many people think that 1908 is the big flood, but 1896 was also a big flood. Hussein Sagar breached at that time. We have known floods of that kind for a very long time. What happened was 1908 flood led to the creation of the City Improvement Board with Moksha Gundam Visveshwaraya coming in and actually giving a set of engineering solutions. Those solutions worked for a certain period of time as stable formations infrastructurally, engineering wise and socially and then it began to collapse. Right? It's that collapse which we don't seem to be talking about at all because we keep saying that that Purana infrastructure reha gaya hai, we haven't improved on that. But actually what has happened is that the old structure has collapsed and there's a reason why that has collapsed and I'll come to that in a moment. So in December 2022, UNICEF commissioned a study on floods in Hyderabad which will be to building uh, civil society capacity as well as building relationship between the government and civil society, particularly through the National Disaster Management Authority mechanism. And this is an important thing for us because in NDME, the National Disaster Relief mechanisms have a lot of resources in them which are not accessed by state governments uniformly. Odisha manages to take a lot of those resources and uses them effectively. Uh, you will have uh, Kerala doing that and there's a reason why these two states jump onto it very quickly and do it because for them their political future depends on saving lives. Urban floods for us are of a different kind. They don't result in so many losses, so much loss of life. Heat for example is a slow killer. We know that heat has always resulted in the last few years in Hyderabad and in many other cities you will have increased number of strokes, you will have increased numbers of uh, chronic kidney disease and none of those things are ever associated with or attributed to heat and because it is not associated or attributed, policies related to uh, cool roof are talked about casually but nobody takes it very seriously. Right? So, broadly, how do we figure out ways of tapping into resources from the National Disaster Relief Mechanism is a key issue that we have to think about. I am going to read a paragraph to you which is actually a very interesting one because um, it is written at a particular time in a particular way and I find this, always find this, this these paragraphs very, very fascinating, right? As a, just as a piece of text to remind myself of what, what, what this is all about. The river Musi passes through the city of Hyderabad Deccan and divides it into two parts. On September 28, 1908, a cyclonic flood of unusual intensity passed through the middle of the city. The rainfall recorded at Shamshabad, one of the principal rain gauge stations in the catchment area was 12.8 inches in 24 hours and 18.9 inches in 48 hours. This fall resulted in the most destructive flood that had been witnessed in Hyderabad city for over three quarters of a century. Right? We are talking exactly the same thing in 2012. Unusual events of this kind have always happened. Right? The northern bank of the river was on a lower level than the southern one. Right? Charman ki taraf jo hai, that is at a higher level. The, the, the Koti side, Isamiya Bazar side is a lower level. 
The river basin above the city abounded in small tanks, there being 788 tanks in a basin of 860 square kilometers, roughly at the rate of one tank for every square mile of the catchment. Right? So you basically draw a grid of one square mile and put it on the map of Hyderabad city, you will find one water body in every cell of that. The valley of the Musi River, which caused this flood, consisted of two rainfall basins. The Musi proper with a catchment of 285 square miles and EC with a 525 square miles. From the levels marked of the flood, it was calculated the discharge within began with 1,10,000 cusacks and rose to a maximum of 4,25,000 cusacks. In the valleys of these rivers, every tank of any consequence gave away. In all, 221 tanks are reported to have breached, of which 182 were in the EC catchment and 39 in the Mosi River. This is the 1908 flood, of which if you go to, to uh, Miyamashk Masjid, if you go to the um, Badishai Ashur Khana, if you go to uh, so many locations along the Mosi River, you will find the HFL markers, the high flood level markers, marble plaques are kept on the walls of buildings and that's the point up to which the water came, right? So this is actually from the autobiography of Mokshagundam Vishweshraya, these two paragraphs that I have just read. Mokshagundam Vishweshraya, who, 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 Bangalore, and there's a railway museum in his name in, in, in Bangalore. He was an engineer uh, with the Bombay presidency, he had retired and he had gone to Italy to look at the Sistine Chapel and that's what he was doing when he receives a telegram from Hyderabad saying that please come back, we need you to come back here and fix our problem. Right? We have a lot of other legends associated with this that Mehbub Ali Khan was urged by people the priests of a temple that he should step into the river and do an aarti and the river will go away, you know, all kinds of stories like that. But the real engineering solution was sought from Vishweshraya. So Vishweshraya, who is having on a holiday after his retirement with his wife, comes back after a month, takes a ship, comes back and then the job that he was given was three things, to advise and assist in the reconstruction of the city because the city was just terribly damaged to frame proposals for future protection of the city from the floods and to prepare a complete scheme of drainage for the Hyderabad city and Chadar Ghat. Right? This is 1908, which then leads to a number of things that were done in the city. Right? 1912, they create what many people in Hyderabad know as, know as Arai Shabaldia, City Improvement Board. Then 2012, uh, Leonard Munn, who is known actually as a geologist who was very good at building wells in an area where it was difficult to build wells. Abhi, you go to Raichur and districts like that in Karnataka, you will find wells which are known as Manbhavi. Manbhavi is the well dug by Man. Right? People still respect those wells as wells dug by Leonard Man. They are octagonal wells, the very particular type of digging a well and holding the soil from collapsing. Right? So Leonard Man was asked to do the municipal mapping of the city. So every square inch of the city was literally mapped and put on a on 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 a on two sets of maps, 400 to 1 and 1 to 50. Those are the two scales on which the maps were made, which were held by the town planning department for a very long time. And then nobody knows where they disappeared in Hyderabad, but one set is in MIT, which has digitized it and put it online. And, um, and that was done because uh, Omar Khalidi was in MIT and he collected it from, from uh, uh, Karen Leonard, who was an anthropologist, and said, Saro ko digitize kar do, online dal do. So every part of it that he could lay his hands on are there. And then we have some private collections in Hyderabad. So Siyasat newspaper has one collection, uh, SP Shore has one collection, I know that um, uh, Kalakriti Prashant Lahoti has one collection, then there is uh, one architect that I know who has a personal collection, but Baki otherwise, the one place where it should be, which is the, the town planning department of Telangana, doesn't have them. So it's a strange tragedy, but that's what it is. So you have the city improvement board, you have the, the, uh, um, the municipal mapping done, but the big thing that was done is that two flood balancing reservoirs were built, 
on the Mosi River. And those two flood balancing reservoirs, Usman Sagar and Himayat Sagar, for which he made the plan, it was executed by Hyderabadi engineers. So that was the one big thing that was done. And the second thing that was done is to create very strong embankments for all tanks so that they don't collapse like this and create a very systematic plan for draining out the water. That's the key thing. So one of the main studies that is being done engineering wise, which I still think is a very important study, is that there are people now in engineering departments in Hyderabad who have set up in all the key nalas, important nalas, sensors for measuring when the water level goes up beyond a certain depth. And with that, with all of the available data that they have, they are trying to make an assessment of what is the carrying capacity or holding capacity of each catchment in the city. Usse zyada agar pani aagya within a short time, then we have to find a way of draining it off as quickly as possible, otherwise it's going to flood. That's the broad principle. How far they will succeed, how quickly they can do it is a different matter. I trust them, I want them to do it, I want it to happen, but I also feel that it can take a long time. Right? So given that, what do we do before that because people are going to suffer each time there is a flood. Right? They can't, they, we cannot tell them that we will do something for 4 years. Just to give you a sense of what the city's water systems look like, right? just the western part of it. That's the, the heart shaped thing is the Hussein Saga. This is a 1935 map. That's the density of connections and this happens like this because it's a very very typical Deccan land uh, 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 pattern that is that you have here rocks and hills which are older than the Himalayas actually um, these are rocks on which you have an extremely chaotic pattern of drainage so that water can go left right front back in all kinds of direction there's no easy pattern to it unlike in the Gangetic plain where it falls down you know where it's going to go here it, you don't know where it will go so what happened is that by the 12th century people had figured out how to create water harvesting structures everywhere so the Bhadrakali uh, um, tank in, in, in Varangal that's the big first one but after that many others similarly all over India we had developed by then earthen construction technology so for example the, the Kaveri Dam earthen dam which is what actually taught the British how to build dams. I mean, they had built in Sheffield one dam before that, it collapsed. So they were really badly hurt, they didn't know how to do it. French guys knew a little bit of dam building which is how the Miralam tank was built. Miralam tank actually has a very strong French imprint on it. Right? The British didn't know. The British learnt from the earthen bund building of Kaveri which then they replicated in all the other places. That's the, the engineering story. So given all of those kinds of, of, of uh, um, histories, what do we do in, in a city like Hyderabad now? Right? So this is a map of the elevation. You can see the two big uh, reservoirs, but you see the elevation in the sense that you look at the northern side, you have a um, a very strong uh, brown patch there, which is where all the hills is, right? So this, can I point to this? No, no. but I can step and so. Yeah, so you can see here, right? Banjara Hills, right? You go here. This is all your Shamshabad area. Right? All of those are hills. Right? So basically what happens is this is your river. Makes perfect sense, right? Pani upar se aega, yaha, lagta hai niche se, but it's basically coming down. But this is a higher area. So it comes from Shamshabad and comes from, from Kompeli. Right? That's the two directions from which the from which the water will come. And then you have the GHMC boundary and you can still see the elevation story. Right? Now you're beginning to see the natural drainage networks. Right? So we pulled out all of this from, from satellite imagery and then because from that data you can actually pull out the elevation data. From that we actually modeled all of the 
the drainage patterns.